Uh, without further ado, I want to thank our sponsor, Baker Botts. Um, this is a topic that I'm very interested in, and you are all probably getting lots of emails every day about this, so it's hot topics in ESG. Um, they're going to talk first about the SEC climate-related disclosure. Um, proposed rule came out recently, and if there's time, we'll, we'll talk about sustainable debt financing, which is what I do at Bank of America, amongst other things. So um, I will turn it over to Preston Bernheisel. I'll introduce him real quick uh, with Baker Botts. He's a partner and chair of the Dallas Corporate uh, Department. And next to him is Brian Henderson. Um, and he also, I guess, works in corporate and does private equity and M&A and all that good corporate stuff. All right, so I'll turn it over to you all. Thanks. Thank you. Can you hear us okay? All right, thanks. Yeah, so um, both of us are in our, our corporate department. Um, similar practices. I, I focus on M&A, capital markets, and securities, um, largely in the energy space. Brian? Yep, and um, I'm Brian Henderson, and uh, also in our corporate department, and I hope co-lead our private equity group, but also work with uh, public companies in mo mostly M&A and also securities uh, areas. Yeah. I'd like to give a shout out to our associate Trevor Labarge who, who put this presentation together and is here with us. Um, so we are, um, as was said, we are, are covering this agenda where when we initially sign up to do this, um, we're going to do Hot Topics in ESG, which um, several months ago was going to be, you know, kind of assessing the tension between um, ESG reports and the SEC's desire that all material information be included in their filings. In the fall, the SEC came, SEC came out with a sample comment letter, and we we're going to talk about that, and then also, you know, sustainable debt financing. And then the SEC sideswipes us with actually coming out with their proposed rules. And um, so we took a look at it and decided there's not really a whole lot there, so we're going to focus <laughs> most of our time on sustainable debt financing because, you know, no controversy with the rules. Now, now obviously, it's, it's going to be quite the opposite. We're going to spend most of our time on the, the new rules, and if we can hit some uh, sustainable debt financing at the end, we'll do that. So as, if, if, as surely most of you have heard, on March 21st, the uh, SEC came out with their new proposed rules for mandated uh, climate-related disclosures. So this was a over 500 pages, um, which, you know, kind of printing anything like that out just kind of eats, you know, cuts against the, uh, the proposed uh, care for the environment in the first place. But the, the general requirement is to disclose um, climate-related risks that are reasonably likely to have a material impact on a company's business or, long, or consolidated financial statements over the short, medium, or long term. And so there, there's a few key terms in there that we'll, we'll hit. Um, but generally, the, the SEC decided that you know, a number of companies were voluntarily, or, or, or basically because they're required to disclose, disclose uh, material information, um, disclosing uh, information about their climate risk and, and, and related operations. And the SEC said, well, we wanted to provide consistent, comparable, reliable information for investors. Um, they had been talking about proposing this rule for, for a while. People had been asking for something on this. And so the SEC finally uh, came out. Now, I think a number of people, a lot of people were surprised at the um, sweeping nature of the rule. I mean, it's difficult to overstate the impact on, on companies that, that this uh, rule would, re would require in the amount of uh, resources and efforts, um, but we'll we'll get into a lot of the details here. Um, some of the key features of the rule focus on what it does with respect to the governance, oversight, and internal control. So it's not just purely your GHG disclosures or operations, but but how your board of directors and management um, oversee your your climate risks. Um, also, if the company has uh, targets or goals. Um, but, but on that, and we're going to talk about it, it's getting into minute details. You know, a lot of times you've seen recently companies come out with flashy headlines of looking to be net zero by year, you know, 2030. Well, the SEC says that's great. Now you're going to get into the minutia of, of how you're going to get there. Um, also financial statements, and, and we're going to focus on, on each of these individually, but on a line item basis, talking about the impact of climate uh, risk on a company's um, financial statements. That's metrics, estimates, ex expenditures, assumptions. 
And then also just general GHG emissions reporting and, and the various scopes there that we'll, we'll explain a little bit further. Um, so turn to Brian. Sure. Uh, so we want to just focus a little bit for a few minutes on on some of the key terms. So I'm going to repeat it just because it, it bears repeating. But the, the new disclosure requirement uh, it relates to climate-related risks that are reasonably likely to have a material impact uh, on, on the business or financial statements over the short, medium, or long term. And so just to, let's take those in reverse order. Materiality is, is, has been said to be the cornerstone of our uh, disclosure system. And generally, uh, it, it's pr well established for you know, probably, let's see, probably over 30 years and even further back than that. Uh, that it's, but it, the SEC actually adopted this standard 30 years ago, that there's a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would consider the information important in deciding how to vote or make an investment decision. Um, <clears throat> And, and reasonably likely uh, is, is the disclosure threshold for when it, it, something may have an impact uh, on the company's financial condition. And so there's been some, some interesting, like it, it's difficult, it's, it's, as we'll get to in the next slide, this changes the, this, even though we use these same terms, the SEC is saying just by the rulemaking itself, which was, which was over 500 pages, uh, is saying that we think these things, or at least implying, and in some cases saying we believe these things are material. Um, and so the, a climate-related risk, there's, there's two kinds. There's physical risk and then uh, transitional risks. So physical risk in, involve both chronic risk over the long term. Uh, what, what, is the, what is the impact of global warming or rising uh, sea levels, and what are, uh, what are what about acute risks such as uh, you know acute weather risks as hurricanes, tornadoes, um, etc. Uh, and then transitional risk relate to risk to your business based on a, an economy that maybe tra is transitioning from energy in different respects, and what what kinds of risks that poses. So, I'll flip to this next uh, this next slide. So the, the, I think there is a, this, this slide is pretty important because it shows you the massive uh, directional shift uh, with respect to environmental matters vis-a-vis uh, -vis the current uh, disclosure uh, framework. So the current disclosure framework is, is really principles-based disclosure. And what, what you disclose is generally based on the registrant's view of materiality. So, uh, that, that is shifting here, and the SEC, if this rule is adopted, will require certain disclosures and in, in very detailed uh, form. And so instead of, instead of having a flexible system in which uh, the registrant says, that we believe this is material. Now, of course, that, that, that has to uh, align with uh, that there is, there's risk there that if, if, you, if you omit something that's clear material, invest, you can be subject to to litigation risk, so it's not as though you know they get to decide what is material. There's still the material materiality standard we talked about earlier, uh, but but here we're really shifting to a little bit more of a of a European system on disclosure rather than what has been historically the the U.S. view of disclosure um, being principles based. So. Stepping back, where are we? Where are we at? The SEC, SEC made these proposals a couple weeks ago, and the comment period will run for 30 days. Um, well, it's, this is very complicated. It, it, at, at a, the comment period will run until at least May 20th, 2022. It's actually keyed off of when uh, the, the proposed rule is published in the Federal Register, which I don't believe has happened yet, at least as of as of yesterday afternoon. And so the comment period will be open. Um, for, for a little while, and we expect there to be quite a few comments. There, are, the, there already have been people uh, up and filing comments, so we believe that will continue. I mean, there's thousands of comments that have already been submitted. Yes. yes. Okay, so um, going to, who, do, who does this rule apply to? Well, it's every public company. Um, so if, if you're public, you're, you're going to have to comply with this rule in some since um, there are exceptions for small uh, reporting companies, but otherwise it's, it's applicable to everybody with different phase-in periods that we'll, we'll get to in a minute. Um, so this applies to not only your, your 10Ks, uh, your Qs, you know, your Exchange Act filings, 
for registration statements. A company now that is going public and filing an S1 is going to have, once this rule is adopted and, and is applicable, we'll have to, um, we'll have to comply with that. Um, also, if you're going to do a business combination and you're doing an S4, I mean, this, this is part of the things that people are going to start thinking about when you're acquiring a company and taking on that company's um, climate risks, and that's going to then flow into um, the acquirer's uh, disclosure. Um, so, again, these climate-related risks, and we're, we're going to go through each of these, these types of disclosures that, that come through the rule that's applicable to these, uh, these public companies. So first, um, governance, oversight, processes, and internal controls. So, so basically, the, the SEC is saying we're starting at the top, okay? This is not just a, a rule of what you're going to have to say in your, in your 10K about your climate risk. We want to know and we want you to disclose um, how your board and management oversee this, okay? So um, registrants, companies will be required to disclose and describe whether any board members have climate-related expertise and identify board members or committees that are responsible for this oversight. So first, identify any board members or board committees responsible for the oversight. Um, that could be an existing committee, it could be your audit committee or a separate committee that you established to focus on climate-related risks. Some, some companies have already moved in the direction of having a ESG committee or, or, or similarly titled committee that focuses on these things. Um, and so you're going to have to identify that and also describe um, whether any members of the board have any particular expertise in this climate-related risk. Um, also, disclosing how the board is informed about climate-related risk and how frequently the board considers those risks. So, I mean, that's, that's getting, in, again, into the details of not just who's on your board and who has the expertise, but how is that information collected and passed to the board. Also, whether the board or the committee um, considers those risks as part of the overall strategy, their risk management, and financial oversight. And then finally, whether, um, whether and how the board sets climate-related targets or goals and how it oversees the progress of the company with those targets and goals, um, including whether there's any interim um, goals. So, so again, governance is, is one aspect of it. Another aspect of it is the financial statements. Um, here, and, and this is a... a significant impact, um, particularly when you think about the cost of what it means where your auditors and accountants are going to have to be very involved in this, um, as well as third parties with attestations that we'll get to in a little bit. But, but as far as the financial uh, impact metrics, you'll require to have a narrative discussion of whether and how these climate-related risks affect or are reasonably likely to affect your consolidated financial statements. Um, this includes disclosure about the actual metrics the, of, of expenditures um, and capitalized costs, both positive and negative, and also um, financial estimates and assumptions providing a qualitative description of how um, weather-related or climate-related events have impacted the uh, development of your estimates and assumptions, um, and whether these estimates and assumptions are used um, in the financial statements were impacted by exposures to risk or uncertainties um, with, with, with respect to climate-related events. So floods, you know, the freeze from last year, extreme temperatures, wildfires, th those kind of things, all are going to have to go into your, your financial statement uh, assessment. And again, on a line item basis, this is not just a couple of paragraphs in your notes to financial statements, but uh, actual the financial statements themselves, a line item that then gets into more detail in, in the notes. Um, an estimation of uncertainties that are that are driven by the application of your judgments and assumptions, and you know this is just going to be a whole lot. You know we're, we're used to, particularly as lawyers, looking at these regulations and and feeling like okay, this particular disclosure rule is something that I can understand and, and wrap my arms around, but but this is also going to involve the accountants in the company and then the auditors and everyone kind of working together, and you can see kind of the massive efforts that that are required by, by virtue of having these disclosure rules. Yeah, uh, so the, the proposed rules require uh, disclosure of what's referred to as scope one, scope two, and scope three 
uh, greenhouse gases. And so there's, there's different kinds of greenhouse gases. Uh, certainly carbon dioxide is one of the, the leading, but there's you know, five others as well that are considered greenhouse gases. But that, I really like this slide because I think it shows, it, it just illustrates what these different scopes are. And so direct, scope one is direct. So things like the company facilities and vehicles, like how much, how, what, what level of emissions are coming from those. Second is indirect. So you, you, know, you can calculate uh, the level of emissions coming from you know, more or less the energy resources that you are using as a company. Um, and, but then scope three, uh, is really what, what the SEC referred to as the value chain. And you just look at this slide and you think about how broad it is to capture both upstream and downstream activities. So, you know, what, what goes, uh, what are you buying to go into your, into your goods or services? Uh, what are your, what uh, emissions are your employees causing by commuting to your office? Uh, what kinds of travel are you doing? Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, on the downstream activities, what's, What's happening with the products that you that you uh, produce that you make? Uh, what happens to the products after they leave uh, your factory or your plant? Um, and you know you can you can just see by the the, the vastness of this uh, required disclosure in looking at this slide and just thinking about how and when you think about wh where these emissions are coming from, it's coming from the use of energy and how that permeates really our 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 lives. And so it, it, it this has been one of the critical are the key uh, pieces that has come under a lot of criticism uh, from, from various sides because it, it is just difficult to know how you can uh, describe these. So we talked about this already. Uh, this slide really summarizes scope one and, and two and three, so just keep going here. Um, you know, in addition to the, you know, we're all familiar with uh, auditors' attestations around financial statements. Um, and the requirements that on that front, this rule would require similar attestations uh, from, from uh, climate experts, effectively. And so uh, it would apply to accelerated file, filers and large accelerated fire, filers. Now, notably, only, the attestation requirements only uh, apply to scope one and scope two. So that probably is helpful if you think about, again, that scope of how broad the scope three is. But the, the experts, are the, the attestation must be made by an expert. Um, it needs to be at a particular point in time. Um, you know, it needs to describe its limitations. It needs to say the standard by which the attestation is made. And I've, I find this really interesting uh, in that the, the attestation provider is making the standard and describing uh, how, how you know, what, what standard they're um, attesting to. And so that, that, that has been one area that, and there's certainly been, and the, the rationale for that uh, is that the, the commission said they didn't want to define a, a single methodology because the, the reporting landscape is evolving and changing. And that's certainly true. I and mean, if you look uh, in, internationally and in, in our country, there are lots of different disclosure regimes, all of which have a little bit different flavor. Um, and so, but essentially the SEC is asking for an attestation to something without creating a, a specific standard, but rather punting and seeing how that evolves. And that, that's been uh, the subject of some criticism uh, from some angles because it, it, it kind of shows with one of the rationales for this rule is for it to have kind of consistent, reliable, dis and comparable disclosure. Um, if you have, if company A, B, and C all have a different at, um, attestation expert, you can see where that, and maybe use slightly different standards, you can see where that maybe is not as helpful uh, as, as something where everyone is applying the same rules. So uh, going back to the scope three emissions, there is a materiality uh, exception or standard uh, and disclosure is only required if, it, if, 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 the, if the scope three emissions are material, or, or if you have uh, if you have a goal uh, of a certain goal with respect to scope three emissions. So if you have a net zero goal, you will need to make scope three emissions. And this concern, you can certainly see this as uh, kind of some of the concerns around folks just making statements about what all the things they're doing environmentally, but not really having a plan to get there. And so that. 
it certainly makes some sense to say if, if, if you have a goal, you will, you will do the full uh, spectrum of disclosure, scope one, scope two, and scope three. On the materiality, we go back to the, the same question as before. How do you make that determination? Well, there's lots of one, uh, one tension before these rules came out that Preston referred to in the introduction is the SEC is saying to, to many companies, well, you have a sustainability report that's 40 pages and you, know, you spend two paragraphs or a paragraph or you don't talk about it at all in your, in your public filing, so you know, why aren't you disclosing that? And the, and the company would come back and say, well, we don't th think that's material under the uh, existing standard uh, about how investors make investment decisions. What does an invest investor <clears throat> need to know that would change the total mix of facts? And so it, this is a little bit circular, and how do you think about, well, you can, don't have to disclose scope three unless it's material. Uh, many companies are already saying, well, this isn't material. But you know, with, certainly with the rules in place, uh, the the as they were doing before these before the proposed rules, the SEC is saying, well, we we think this is material, and asking people to explain why they're not. So I think we can, you know, expect that to continue. Yeah, and so another um, going along with that uh, materiality exception, there is a safe harbor and a small reporting company exception for for scope three. So. Given the difficulty that the SEC acknowledges with respect to um, figuring out and, and reporting on your, your scope three emissions, um, they have included a safe harbor. We're going to talk a little bit about the impacts of litigation and, and liability later, but this safe harbor basically is that um, you will not have liability under, under the securities laws for disclosure um, unless you, it can be shown that you did not make that disclosure um, with a reasonable basis or that it was not in, in good faith. And so um, kind of puts a, a, a little bit of a uh, lower, state, lower threshold in terms of your disclosure for these scope three matters uh, specifically. Um, I, I think without that, there would have been a right. I mean, people are already clamoring, of course, over the scope three requirement to begin with, and it's probably the most likely to be, if there is anything going to be trimmed back in the final rule, it would be around that. Um, but without the safe harbor, I mean, it, it would just, it, it, people would have lost their minds about um, having liability for your value chains, disclosure of your value chains emissions, um, that that's not your own emissions. Um, another exemption is if, if you're a smaller reporting company. So, you know, the, the companies that have annual revenues less than 100 million and a public float less than 700 million. So, you have that group, and there, there's a number of those small reporting companies, but everybody else is subject to this, this rule, um, albeit with the, the safe harbor. And we're going to talk about the, um, the com compliance phase in now. So, a, a, as you can see in this chart, um, and, and this is also part of what the SEC has put out. Um, that there's, there's different compliance dates for uh, the different size of, of filers and also the type of uh, disclosure. So for scope one and scope two, um, for large accelerated file filers, this starts um, with respect in 2024, making the filing about your fiscal year 2023. So it's, it's expected, the, the SEC has stated their goal that this rule will go in place by, by December of this year. And that means starting in 2023, companies are going to start tracking um, their um, risks and what their disclosure is going to end up looking like uh, beginning in 2024 for large accelerated filers, and then the following year for accelerated, non accelerated, and then 2025 uh, filed in 2026 for small reporting companies. For scope three, they can put that off for one more year. So, so each of these size filers can, can um, wait one extra year before you have to get into your scope three um, disclosure. And like I just, like we said in the prior slides, small reporting companies are, are exempted from that altogether. Um, going back to the, the level of review, and, and Brian talked about the attestation reports and kind of we talked about your financial statements and, and having those uh, reviewed, there are also uh, phase in in terms of um, when, when you're required to, what level of assurance you're, you're required to give. So phase, uh, again, starting, let's assume you're a large accelerated filer. Starting in 2024, you make a filing about your prior fiscal year 2023, um, about your scope one and two disclosure. But then the following year, you're going to have to start giving a, a um, giving that disclosure with a limited assurance standard. And, and what that means is that's essentially, the, that, that is the standard by which auditors currently review quarterly reports. So it's not an audit, 
but it is the, the accountants, independent accountants review of your quarterly financial statements. That level of review, that's the level of assurance that kicks in um, starting in, filing, filing in 2025 for, for your fiscal year 2024. And then a year after that is reasonable assurance. And that is the, that sounds okay, reasonable assurance, but that's the level of assurance that auditors give in their actual audit report, okay? So that's a, that's a big step up to an actual audit level of review um, starting in filings in 2027 for 2026 fiscal year. And again, it's the year following for each of these for accelerated filers. So um, again, th there is time, but you quickly get to these higher levels of, of um, assurances for these things that people are at that point only used to even disclosing in the first place, uh, at least for mandatorily for, for a couple years. Um, the other aspect of, you know, we, so we talked about governance, we talked about the um, financial statements, the GHG um, disclosure. The other aspect that we mentioned previously is, is the targets and goals. So, again, you've seen companies come out with a, a goal to reduce GHG emissions by, by a certain percentage by a certain year, or their energy usage, or, you know, restoration, um, going net zero by a certain year. Um, up until now, companies have been able to set those goals internally, internally and not say anything at all. Or maybe they say something in a press release or, or a, um, you know, a, a roadshow or something like that, but it's not actually in their, their public you know, reports. In fact, we dealt with a company recently that, that made that very decision. They said, hey, we've got this new net zero goal, but you know, it's far enough out and we don't see it as material enough that we're not going to put it in our 10K, but, you know, they, they mention it maybe in the script when they're, when they're doing their, their earnings release. Um, well, that, that all is going to have to change. The, 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 the rule here is that if you set these targets or goals, that you have to disclose them um, and that you disclose the activities and the emissions included in that target, how you intend to get to that target or goal, and whether you're, what the status of your progress is. You know, these companies that felt great about putting out a net zero, you know, 2030, and thought, okay, we've got that, that's time for us to get there. Well, now you're gonna be talking about it, you know, on a quarterly basis about everything, that basically your status of that goal. And so part of the disclosure here is, um, again, the scope of activities, the unit of measurements, what, the, what that actual indicator or, or um, target is, your defined time horizon. Um, also, if, if that goal is consistent with any other regulations that are out there, you know, climate-related treaties or laws, uh, policies. Um, also, the defined baseline time period and baseline emissions of what you're measuring against. Again, interim targets and goals, and then very specifically how you intend to, to get there. Um, so, you know, you may see some companies stepping back a bit in terms of their, their targets and goals or, or feeling like they've got to put a lot of work into um, backing those up. So with, with an overview of, the, now you have an overview of the rules generally, and we thought we'd spend just a few minutes uh, talking about the, the, the political landscape really uh, and proponents' views of, of the proposed rules and kind of dissenting opinions. Now, uh, the, the commission uh, adopted the proposed rules on a three to one vote um, and it was along party lines based on uh, who, uh, wh whether a Democratic or Republican president appointed the commissioner. So uh, proponents' arguments and support. Now, if you read the, the 500 page proposal, uh, there's there's kind of arguments throughout, and we've referenced uh, a fair number of them already. But uh, you know, the, the proponents would point out that lots of companies were already doing this, and we'll flip to some some uh, slides in a moment showing you that that's true. Uh, there are an, a, a fair number, fair percentage of companies that are doing this. Uh, that, but one of the overarching goals was to make disclosure more consistent. Right now it's fragmented. They try to put, set some standards, uh, put some standards in place, address greenwashing concerns, you know, companies uh, making, say, saying that they have these goals or kind of using a lot of fluff uh, around their environmental and sustainability programs, but not, uh, not really applying the same uh, standards as it, that, that they would to some of their other disclosure. Um, you know, they want to make uh, information more comparable uh, and, uh, you know, 
ultimately say that the existing environmental disclosures don't adequately protect investors. And this is important, uh, important for the protection of investors, uh, which, as you'll see, w you know, will be important in something that's that uh, comes uh, that is questioned by the dissenting opinions. Yeah, and there's plenty, plenty of arguments on the on the dissenting side or the, or the opposing side. And I mean, if you take a step back and you just look at the SEC's purpose of the of the rule to say, hey, we want to standardize, um, you know, the the disclosure that a lot of companies that are already doing, um, that makes sense. I mean, that that sounds reasonable, right? But it, but it's the extent to which they've gone. Um, and the, the difficulty in get there, but also the fact that there are a lot of questions around whether their rule does what they claim to say uh, it, it will and in terms of providing a standardized approach. And so there, there's you know, a, a number of rules here over the next couple slides that we'll get to, but you know, the, the SEC lacks authority or, or ad adequate statutory uh, uh, power authority to do this. Um, that's probably not gonna go very far, right? I mean, the... Um, say the SEC doesn't have the authority to do this. I mean, really what that comes, what that comes down to is you look at their congressional uh, mission from the SEC, uh, for the SEC, and that is to protect investors, facilitating capital formation, fostering fair, orderly, and efficient markets. Um, so basically the, the sufficient regulatory authority to achieve that balance in those efficient, orderly, efficient markets, but not plenary power. Um, and so, you know, that raises the, the question, do they have the authority to do this? That's, that's probably not going to get very far. But a lot of the other arguments, and, and these are the, what we're seeing already in the comments that are being um, submitted, go to things, you know, like Brian said about that there was already this existing um, framework. So, so in 2010, the commission put in place guidance to help companies um, apply existing disclosure rules in the context of climate change. And so... And as I mentioned at the beginning, they, they put out in the fall a sample disclo uh, disclosure review comment letter that um, really underscored the need for companies to apply the existing requirements to climate risks, and then they provided guidance along, along those lines. Um, also, the, the SEC has taken a, a more aggressive uh, posture in its review of these disclosures, and people have reacted to that, and we've seen disclosure get better and better. And so the argument is that companies are already doing this. Those who have truly climate-impacted um, businesses and operations are already already disclosing this, um, and and that they're, it's unnecessary to, to go to the extent that the SEC has gone with this. Um, the other argument about um, not having comparable or consistent, reliable standards um, is that uh, basically it's directing companies to, to, to speculate about what their customers and their employees and their, uh, are, are doing in changing climate policies and regulations and things that companies certainly have been keeping in mind and, and been well aware of, but now you're forcing companies to say, okay, I'm going to take all that and put it into language in our SEC report, our, our Exchange Act filings, that, by the way, we are liable for our misstatements now, and that's just a, a much, you know, higher, ta larger task than, um, than just generally kind of having a, a good sense of risk and disclosing generically kind of what those risks are. Um, other, other arguments in opposition is generally the harm to the economy, that, that the amount, uh, despite the noble intentions and... Um, you know, purpose of this goal that, that it really brings complexity and uncertainty enough to where companies are going to have to spend a lot of resources um, and, and effort and time in figuring out how to comply with these rules and to avoid the liability that, that attaches to the disclosure, um, really with no expertise currently in those companies necessarily about, um, you know, the... Um, the approach again that their, their, some of their customers and suppliers um, that, that is going to have to fill into these uh, these disclosures, and so um, not only asking companies to tell us what they do, but but essentially the argument is the SEC is telling them how to do it and saying by implication of telling us what what your board expertise is is kind of companies are going to feel that you know pressure to go out and have an expert on their board and and you can say well maybe that's a good thing but again it's 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 pushing 
behavior more in a lot of ways that it is more than just kind of the disclosure for the investors that the SEC says the, the ultimate goal is. And ultimately, when, the, when, the, when you have these, all these costs layering on, that the, the argument is that the economy could be hurt. Um, we talked about kind of the SEC taken out of its, being taken out of its statutory uh, authority, you know, the First Amendment, that is compelled speech, probably, again, not going to go very far. But, but a lot of really good arguments um, about the, in, in um, opposition to these rules. Uh, probably the biggest groundswell of, of dissent that we've probably seen in, in, for rules in a long time. And so it will really be interesting to see how the, the SEC reacts. Like Brian said, you've got these commissioners. Um, one of them rolls off this next summer, but of course will be appointed by a similarly thinking um, commissioner in all likelihood with, from the, the Biden administration. Um, so th there's really not a, a realistic chance that the, the, the commissioners are not going to change their mind. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the um, the, the possibilities of, of challenging the rules, but, but those aren't really going to go anywhere to where we likely see this rule being uh, put in place, and it's going to be more a matter of, of what is in the final rule versus what was in the proposal. Yeah, so, so Preston mentioned and Commissioner Pierce mentioned in her statement you've seen uh, that you know maybe challenges around the First Amendment and is this compelled speech? And when I first thought that, I thought, well, that doesn't really seem to fit quite right to me in the way I think about what a com compelled speech would would be. There was, and and when the SEC issued the Conflicts Minerals Rules uh, about a, de a little over a decade ago, the D.C. Circuit actually said that uh, said that you, they could not, uh, the SEC could not force disclosure around uh, conflicts minerals about where they, where they came from. Um, and so you can see, so it is a possible argument that doesn't seem to be a per, doesn't seem to line up perfectly uh, to me that in this is a much broader context. Uh, clearly, uh, there's it's not just one kind of narrow issue that that the SEC is saying you must disclose X. It's a, a broader regime that that has a lot of support uh, from from governments and non nonprofit organizations and really from companies around the world. Like there, as we said, there's lots of. Uh, large companies are already making these disclosures, so it seems doesn't seem like the perfect uh, the perfect legal challenge. Uh, there, there, most of the rest of the rulemaking um, process challenges will be, de you know, decided under an arbitrary capricious and capricious standard. And so the question that courts have to answer is whether a rulemaking is is arbitrary, capricious, and abuse of discretion, or otherwise not in accordance with law. Um, you know, looking at kind of the case law in that area, you, you most of the time you see those challenges being successful uh, when the notice and rulemaking process isn't very thorough. Uh, if an agency kind of rushes rushes rules out, maybe makes them without having a full comment period or something along those lines, um, and people the, the courts will will question their justification for doing that. Here, that won't be an issue. This has been kind of in the works. Um, the, the, in fact, the SEC like nine or nine or ten months ago requested comments uh, proactively preemptively before they even came out with proposed rules and so this is something that they've been getting lots of feedback on and so you know I think that's a little hard to see uh, to see a challenge being successful if it was I think we're in one area that it could be successful in is around the cost estimates and how much they did there's not a whole lot in the rules in the proposed rules uh, and in the analysis about how much it will cost companies uh, to, to, to comply. Um, they said, you know, basically, you can do this, it won't cost too much. And I, I don't know how thorough that analysis was, so there's some possibility that things we could, the, a court could say, you know, you need to make, uh, make that analysis more thorough. Uh, you know, there's been, it wouldn't be the traditional route, but uh, I think there was over 20 Republican senators just uh, last week uh, that, that sent a letter to the SEC, and one of the items they raise is the the cost that this will have on kind of the, the scope three emissions, so downstream and upstream. And if, if public companies go out to their providers and say, you know, we need X, Y, and Z information, and then are they having to go uh, hire folks, does that cut into their uh, economics and, and drive uh, economic um, outcomes in a way that, that hasn't been thoroughly analyzed? So you can see that's another possibility. Uh, another possibility, there's this major questions doctrine. Some have questioned whether court could come in and say, no, this question is so important uh, that it must be decided by Congress uh, effectively rather than by an agency. Um, 
it, it's that as you might expect in our kind of uh, current governmental system that's not a not a terribly common occurrence uh, that courts are saying well no you must have Congress decide in fact we see more and more agencies deciding so the, none of these challenges to, to us seem terribly likely to succeed but they certainly there's certainly a high chance that they could be made uh, now one question that might if you took one piece of that you can see possibly um, the SEC the commissioners may be saying well we got so many comments so we got we we're seeing so much pressure in these certain areas and you know, the obvious one would be the scope three emissions that they could maybe because remember this is a proposed rule so they could go back and say pull the pull the scope three emissions and say well we're going to keep studying this and go with scope one and scope two so that you know if we think it's likely that these will be adopted uh with maybe but maybe there could be some tweaks based on um based on the comments that are submitted and and just the general kind of uh, political environment And then, thanks. So we thought we'd put in here, just uh, we won't spend long on these slides because most of you are probably familiar with them. Although we just put in a, a couple slides showing, you know, this is something, the, all, their companies are making environmental disclosure um, and even on things like scope one, scope two, scope three. So there are companies out there that are doing that. It's just a, an example of what some of the disclosure looks like. Uh, now, obviously, this is pretty broad and a little bit different than some of the detailed, uh, for instance, financial statement requirements that the proposed rules uh, include. And this is a risk factor. Definitely won't read all this to you, but uh, it, it, companies are already disclosing climate-related risk. Now, obviously, risk factors are, are usually pretty broad uh, and address uh, just about anything that, that a company thinks is material. And so we expect that to, to continue. Obviously, the funds are doing that, and uh, with with this, with these rules are adopted, uh, become more and more standard to have risk factors. So I, I think these slides are really interesting. Uh, this show this is just showing market trends, and you know currently, 33% uh, of all reports contain disclosure relating relating to climate change. So that's you know a third of all companies, and then you break that down by filing status. Uh, and large accelerated fire, filers, almost half, uh, are making disclosures about climate change versus 30%, you know, less than 20% for accelerated and non-accelerated filers. So I, I think that's pretty interesting, and it'll show you how this rule is really, really going to affect uh, companies differently um, and the smaller companies uh, in, a, in a different way uh, than, than the larger companies, just because many of the larger companies have already been implementing uh, a framework to make these disclosures, and you know, there's certainly some speculation on the uh, or d on the on the arguments against the rules that you're, you'll drive more company, smaller companies, out of the public markets altogether because this is just another uh, another cost of of being a public company. Uh, so these are the industries. You know, probably not terribly surprising if you look at. Uh, look at the top five here that where you have the highest percentage of climate related disclosure you know oil and gas utility utilities um, or really kind of energy heavy uh, energy heavy companies okay so what are the risks that go along with these disclosure rules well there's the um, litigation risk that um, again the SEC enforcement, if, if for failure to disclose appropriately under these rules, um, you can get a private action or uh, civil litigation for, um, for reporting violations. Now, I, I, again, the, the scope three emissions are part of a safe harbor from, from that unless there's essentially a fraud you know, standard, but, but otherwise you're, you are liable for your, your disclosures in, in your reports. Um, and um, that, you think about even the scope three, rarely will a company say, okay, there's this, this safe harbor out there, so I'm really not going to spend much time looking into the scope three. I mean, you still have to disclose it, and it's still going to be in there. You're still, you still could get an SEC comment, you know, that may be embarrassing about your, your failure to comply with a rule about scope three. So people, companies are still going to put in the time and effort to, if the scope three rules hold, to, um, to disclose the, that information, even if you have that technical safe harbor as kind of in your back pocket that you may not ultimately have um, liability for it. Um, but SEC investigations lead to shareholder class actions, derivative litigation, 
you know, all, all the liability that you have with your normal disclosures applies to these rules subject for that scope three uh, exception. Um, you know, thousands, thousands of companies that are registered with the SEC, um, you know, 12,000 actual public companies with other investment advisors, mutual funds, and, and other agencies. Um, but the, uh, it, it impacts these companies and it's just, you know, again, sweeping, sweeping impact through, throughout all, all public companies. Um, we'll flip so, through here. We've got a few minutes left. Yeah, we'll, we'll go quickly here. And it, obviously, the, as you can imagine, these, these disclosures, uh, disclosure rules would have a kind of a disproportionate impact on energy companies, uh, especially when you think about, uh, and when you think about like scope three, uh, how difficult it might be for, you know, say a, 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 an EMP company to think about where is my energy being used downstream and then, you know, what kinds of emissions are coming from that. And you, you think about, they're going to have to build assumption on assumption on assumption, really, to, to figure out how, how things are being used, what kinds of end, user, end users are using their products. Um, but we, once, if you have interest in submitting a comment, uh, this is how you do it. Uh, if, probably, if you do, you are well on your, on your way already. So maybe we'll, that, that wraps us up on, uh, on the new rules, or the proposed rules, but we'll, let's spend a few minutes on sustainable debt financing. Yeah, real quickly, it just goes along with the, the SG hot topic, and this, this is something that maybe you've seen um, in, in the news or companies talking about, and that's the, the sustainable debt. And um, you hear about green bonds or sustainability link bonds, and I want to squeeze in a few minutes. This is something I particularly uh, enjoy in, in a lot of the work that I do. Um, and this, this first slide just kind of shows you the trends um, won't get in, bogged down into the numbers, but you can you can essentially see how how the the numbers are doubling, um, or are essentially doubling each year, um, in all kinds of different uh, categories of of types of bonds. Uh, green, which we'll talk about in a minute, social sustainability linked, um, all with the idea of coming closer to investors and and some at least uh, a very loud set of uh, investor desires to be more. Uh, green, environmental friendly um, in connection with their debt. So when you, you, you hear about green bonds and you hear sustainability linked bonds, and, and the basic difference is that green bonds, it's, it's tied to the, the use of proceeds. So nothing about the instrument itself, the indenture, the covenants that you make actually has a requirement that anything relates to, um, you know, environmental protection or anything like that. But your use of proceeds, you commit to apply those proceeds to an eligible green project. And you get an outside um, company that basically certifies to what your, uh, what, what projects are eligible for, for each company. And um, you commit in, in when you issue those notes to the public um, or private that, that you'll take those proceeds and you'll develop, you know, whether it's a, a wind farm or, or some other kind of environmental friendly uh, project with those proceeds. Um, that, that, that's whether it's a loan and there's green loans that have that same feature or actual bonds that, that get issued to um, companies or, or investors. Whereas sustainability linked loans and bonds, that's where the, the proceeds really doesn't matter. The, you, you can use the, the funds that you get from those bonds um, to, to do just, just about anything. But the, um, the, this is where the instruments themselves do have a feature that is tied to, um, you know, a company says we have this key performance. We want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by X percent by, by such and such year. That actually goes into the indenture as a target date where if you haven't hit that goal by that time period and have an outside party certify to it, then the interest rate on the note step up call it 25 you know, basis points and you're, you're paying a higher uh, interest rate on those notes. So it's kind of where it's, people say sustainability linked bonds are green bonds with teeth where it actually has an economic impact on the company if they, if they don't hit that. Now, as you can imagine with anything, people find ways to cut corners and have a goal that is not really pushing them to do a whole lot and you get claims of greenwashing and claiming to, to do this when, you're, when it's really not something that's pushing you very far. And so there's really, you know, there, there's this alphabet soup of, of um, 
organizations that have certifications and you know kind of st stamps of approval, but it's really not the SEC saying it. It's 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 really just a marketing situation, and so there's not really a standard across the board um, that really holds companies to this. Um, but that that's something that the SEC is is keeping an eye on of whether that becomes part of another rule. Of, of in terms of when you're doing a sustainability late bond uh, or, or loans using these key performance indicators and how stringent they are. And, and again, it will tie into these disclosure rules about your progress towards, towards those goals. So with that, we'll, we'll wrap up. We, um, I, I believe we will be able to get these slides uh, and, and, and the presentation to people by email. Uh, so they have this information afterwards, but I guess for a minute or two, open up to questions before people hit the food and drinks. Yeah. It, it's bring, he's bringing around a mic, but. Yeah. I was just wondering, I mean, I, this was really interesting about, about the E and the ESG, and I was just wondering, do you see this as a, a precursor to other disclosure requirements in the, the social space? Do you think this is sort of a test for that, or have you heard anything? In yeah, that I mean, it's area? interesting because I mean, you you see the at least for the for Nasdaq, the rule come out for uh, board diversity rules, um, kind of along those lines, and the SEC hasn't quite acted on that. Um, I, I mean, I think it's it's a possibility, and and there could be at least um, you, you could certainly see, um, kind of going back to that governance point, the. Um, Disclosure around your your social and, and, and your your governance, your board oversight of those kind of social factors and things. I, you can certainly see that. Um, I mean, climate change generally, and what, whatever your feelings about how worrisome that is. Uh, I mean, th that I think was so much bigger and and economically impactful, globally impactful, that, that it certainly pushed them further. But, but I mean, it's a, good, it's a good thought that you could see that being a um, front path to eventually hitting the social aspect as well. Sure. Other questions? We know we're, we, we know we're the uh, last thing standing between you and the happy hour, so. Well, we'll, we'll be around and uh, would love to would love to chat, but really thank you for uh, making time for uh, for this session on the last session of the day. So thanks so much. Thank yeah, thank you.